Okay, I guess I'm gonna get started now. So today is our final review part two, and this is our last class for today for this course. So that would be interesting. And the lesson plan for today, we're gonna first do a final review part two, and then I'd like to end this course with some closing remarks. So let's get started. So I want to review what a nucleide is because these are pretty important for nuclear reactions that you will learn in introductory in your high school course. So a nuclide is an atom with a symbol, atomic number Z, mass number A, and the atomic symbol. Remember the atomic number Z is the number of protons. The mass number A is basically how much it weighs. So it's the sum of the protons and neutrons as electrons are basically massless. And the atomic symbol is the symbol. I don't know why there's, why there's captions. There, you might have, I think I saw something on the bottom that was clicked. Oh, look. the bottom. Yeah, okay, so hover oh. over to the bottom left. Bottom left, yeah. Ab above the captions. Yeah, where? Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry about that. The captions are kind of weird. <laughs> Whoopsies. As I was saying, this is how we define a nucleide. So remember in a neutral atom, there's an equal number of electrons and protons. So it's like this, the mass number A is always on the top, below that is the atomic number Z and then the atomic symbol, which is the one or two letter abbreviation for element. Like on the left in A, that stands for sodium. For uh, hydrogen, it's H, for helium, it's HE. So it's unique to the individual atom. So I'm gonna do a poll and see what you guys think. So what is a nucleide symbol for lithium with symbol Li? So please don't be shy and try to figure it out. To the right, this is actually a picture of lithium. And I would like to give you a hint. Remember, it's uh, a z nucleide, where NU is the nuclear symbol. Okay, so there's three more people who haven't voted, two more. Okay, I'll share the results. Oh, seven voted. So as you can see, there was a kind of even split between A and B and also D. So now I'll go over it. So the, the key is the bottom right here. Uh, protons are the positive charge, neutrons are the normal charge, and we don't need electrons for these nuclide symbols. So the number of protons is three, the number of neutrons is four. So we know the symbol is Li, so we can write that. The top A is the atomic mass. So that's the sum of the mass. So that's seven on the top. And Z is the number of protons, which is three. So it's actually B. 
easy way to do process of elimination for these problems is because the atomic mass is on top, it's going to be greater than the number of protons usually, except for hydrogen. So you, you can't be top heavy. So that rules out A. And C means there'll be zero neutrons. So that's out. And then D means there's one neutron since A minus Z is the number of neutrons. By definition, that means there's one neutron and that's wrong too. So that's another way you can see to get B. We'll do another one of these so you'll have more practice for nucleide symbols. I know they could be a little challenging. B. So let's do it with nitrogen. And what's the nucleide symbol for nitrogen? Remember it is a uh, A, Z, and then the nucleide symbol. Glad a lot more people have gotten this one right. I'll give you some more time. It's kind of hard. The P stands for proton, N stands for neutron, and the blue ones are electrons. So. I hope no one picks C because like the elements, not even nitrogen. That would be weird. Picking the wrong uh, element, but I guess sometimes you don't overlook small things. Okay, so I'm gonna end it and let's see the results. So most of you said D. And that is the correct answer. Good job, everyone. So let me do it on the board. So the, the symbol is N, so that automatically eliminates C. The atomic number Z is the number of protons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's seven. And then there's also seven neutrons. So protons equals seven, neutrons equals seven. So the mass is 14, so it's 14, seven, and that's D. I hope everyone got that. Yep. So now let's uh, talk about the periodic table. So in 1869, there was this Russian chemist called Mendeleev who founded that uh, if you order things by if you order elements such that uh, elements on top of each other share similar properties, you can get an atomic, atomic, a periodic table. And he was the founder of the periodic table. But how he actually ordered them by atomic mass, but today chemists actually order them by atomic number Z, which is the number of protons in an element. So as you can see, this is a, a periodic table. And the first column, first, uh, yeah, first group or column, they all share the same properties. And so is the second column and all of them. For example, this red column right here, they're called noble gases and they usually don't react. The green column right here, they're usually all metals and they react extensively when you put them in water. So they share similar properties. So there's three classifications of elements in the world, uh, metals, metalloids, and non-metals. So metals are the most common type. They're usually shiny solids and they conduct electricity. 
Non-metals are the complete opposite. Well, for, I like to get, uh, yeah, non-metals are like the opposite. They're usually gases and they don't, they're not good at conducting electricity like oxygen or nitrogen. And the last group is metalloids, which is in the middle. So they're elements that contain some metal properties and some non-metal properties. So they're usually okay at conducting electricity at high temperatures, but they're really poor at low temperatures like silicon, which is used a lot in electronics. So here's a table that can tell you the metals, metal, non-metals and metalloids. So the red ones are metals, the yellow ones are metalloids and the blue are non-metal. So we're gonna do a few problems like this. So I'm gonna ask, are these elements A, metals, B, metalloids, or C, non-metals? So you, I, I'll display an element and I want you to hit on the pole. If you think it's metals, choose A. If it's metalloids, choose B. And if it's non-metals, choose C. So our first one is B, R, bromine. Oops, sorry about that. Let me launch a poll. Relaunch. Okay, so click A if you think bromine is a metal. Click B if you think bromine's a metalloid. And click C if you think it's a non-metal. It's B, R. So you have to first find where B, R is. So I'll give you some extra time. I'll probably give you around 45 more seconds. I'm trying to find uh, BR. Okay, 20 more seconds. Guess I'll circle it in orange. 10 seconds. Okay, I'll end it. So here are the results. So we were kind of all over the place. We said A, B, and C. It's good that no one picked D though. That would be a troll answer. But bromine is actually in this one right here, BR. And uh, BR is blue, so that means it's a non-metal. So it's actually C. Yep, C, non-metal. So the three people who said C were correct. Let's do some more. Let's do silicon. So it's just finding where silicon is on the periodic table, which is SI. And just finding if it's a metal, metalloid, or non-metal by looking at the chart. I'll give 30 more seconds. So seven out of eight have voted. So I'll give 10 seconds for the last person. Okay. So it was a big consensus that it's B and that's correct. Good job, everyone. Uh, it's right here. It's yellow, so it's a metalloid.
So let's do one more. Cesium. This one might be a little harder to find. So I'll give you a little more time for this one. And this one will be the last one from these types of questions we do today. So we have two more, I'll give 20 seconds. Okay. So I'll end it and here's the results. So all of you have said A except for one and that's good. It is A, CCM is right here. It's kind of hard to see and it is indeed a uh, Oh, whoops, metal. So let's clean the screen. So now let's talk about molar mass. So we've got, we jumped into descriptive chemistry and now we'll go back to chemistry involving calculations. So the molar mass of the substance is the sum of the atomic masses found on the periodic table. And it's important because that's how we convert between grams and moles. So an example one is like H2O, which is water. To find the molar mass, we look at a table, periodic table, and it'll be like H and it'll be one, and then it'll be like oxygen and there's 16. So we have two hydrogens because this subscript means we have two of hydrogens and one oxygen. So each hydrogen is one. So we have a total of two and we have one oxygen and that's a total of 16. So the molar masses, we just add them up and we get 18. So that's a short review for calculating the molar mass. So I hope we should, you guys should be able to do this problem. Uh, let's start. So we need to find the molar mass of CO2, which is carbon dioxide. So you have to look at the periodic table above to help you answer this question. I'll give some more time since it's a little calculation based. I'll give some more time, probably around 30 more seconds.
Okay. I believe that's time. So as we can see, we were kind of all over the place. It's kind of bad that my uh, answer choices were common mistakes, but I did that on purpose. So when we do these problems, you have to look at carbon dioxide. You have to see what elements are in there. There is one carbon and the subscript of two means there's two oxygens. So the molar mass of carbon is the number down here. It's not that, that's the atomic number. And the molar mass of oxygen is 16 and 12. So the sum of one times 12 is 12 and two times 16 is 32. So we can add them up and we get 44 grams per mole. So that's D. I know C was a tri uh, tricky answer. C would be correct if you did it of carbon monoxide, which is a CO. So that means you neglected the second oxygen by the subscript. The subscript below the oxygen means there's two oxygens. So I hope we cleared that. So let's do one more of these, I think. This one's a little longer, so I'll give you some more time. Find the molar mass of CHCl3. You might need a calculator for this one, maybe. So it's looking pretty good so far. Five people have voted so far. And we're doing a lot better on this one than the last one, so. That's really good. I'll probably give around 45 more seconds to those who are trying to calculate the last bit. After this one, we're going to review two more concepts and they require the molar mass. So it's important that we can find the molar mass of compounds. In chemistry, molar mass is extremely important within almost every branch of chemistry. So especially stoichiometry. So 15 more seconds. Okay, let's share the results. So it was a unanimous of everyone who voted. So that's really good. All five of you got it correct. Great job. For the other people who didn't answer, I'll go over briefly how to do these problems. So it's, you first have to figure out what, how much of each element there are. So for there's three uh, atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine. There's no subscript for carbon, so there's one carbon. There's no subscript for hydrogen, so there's one hydrogen. Their subscript of three means three for chlorine. So this is one times the molar mass of carbon, which is 12. We can round. One times the molar mass of hydrogen, which is one. Three times the molar mass, which is around 35.45. You add them up, you get 12, one, and mm, let me do it right now, 106.35. You add up all of these because the molar mass is the sum of the atomic masses and you get 119.35, which is closest to A. So that good job to everyone. Let me look at the chat for a second. Okay. 
Okay. So now we're going to be converting between moles to grams and grams to mole, and that would be our last thing we review. So you can do a simple calculation. I'll do it right now of the molar mass of uh, ethanol. Uh, if you, it's easy to calculate. The molar mass of carbon is twelve. The molar mass of hydrogen is one and sixteen, and you can multiply by the respective. Uh, respective subscripts to get that the molar mass of ethanol is around 46.1 grams per mole. Of course, there's that decimal because I rounded it in the numbers I gave you, but in this calculation, they took out to many decimal places, so it's slightly off. I think with the numbers I give you, you should get a molar mass of around 46 grams per mole, per mole which is really close. So since we know that the molar mass is 46.1 grams per mole, that means one mole of ethanol is 46.1 grams of ethanol. So we could divide both sides by the right-hand side, and we could get one mole of ethanol over 46.1 gram of ethanol equals one. Or we could divide both sides of this equation by one mole of ethanol and get this one equals one. So since we know that this fraction equals one, we can use it to cancel units out. So let's do an example. So suppo suppose we have 10 grams of ethanol and we want to determine the number of moles. So we start off with what we have, which is 10 grams. And remember, molar mass is the important aspect. So the molar mass is 46.1 grams per mole of ethanol. But we could either multiply it by the molar mass or divide by the molar mass, but it depends on the units we're trying to cancel out. Since we have grams on top, we want grams on bottom, so we divide by the molar mass. We divide by 46.1 and the units cancel out, and we're left with moles. So it's 10 over 46.1, and you get 0.217 moles of ethanol. So that's how we do uh, dimensional analysis or converting between units in chemistry. So I'll do let you guys have an example. So let's relaunch the poll. So how many moles are in 10 grams of nitrogen gas? The molar mass is 28 grams per mole. Okay, okay. Probably one more minute since this one takes a little longer time. Okay, I'll share the results now. So a majority of you guys said B, and that is the correct answer. So I'll now work through how to solve it. So like always, you start off with what you have. The only thing you have is you have 10 grams and we wanna convert it to moles. So we start off with 10 grams of N2. And then remember the only way we can convert between moles and grams or grams to moles is a molar mass. 
So we know that the molar mass is 28 grams per mole. We want the grams to be on the bottom so we can cancel out grams. So we have one mole N2 over 28 grams of N2. And as you can see, the grams of nitrogen gas cancel out. And you could do this arithmetic in your calculator, 0 0.357 moles of N2. So that is B. So that's how you do one of these types of problems. So let's do one more of this, these types of problems, but this time you're gonna to need to calculate the molar mass. So this one might take a little longer. So how many moles are in 100 grams of HCl, which is hydrochloric acid? So you're going to need to calculate the molar mass of HCl and then do grams to moles conversion. Whoopsie, sorry about that. There we go. Go back to the problem. So I'm going to give about 30 more seconds. And please don't tease people in the chat. I'd like it if you guys don't tease each other in the chat. OK, so the majority of us said D. And that is the correct answer. So I'll go over how to do it. So the molar mass of HCl, there's uh, one hydrogen and one chlorine. So that's just one plus 35.45. That's 36.45 grams per mole. And we start off with 100 grams. And we want to use the molar mass and we want the grams to be on the bottom so it could cancel out the grams on the top. So we have 36.45 grams and one mole on the top. And we can just cancel it out. So 100 divided by 36.45, you can put that in your calculator and you should get around 2.74. So it is D. So great job, everyone. Oh, there's one more. Oh, but this time it's moles to grams, so it's the other way around. So here's another poll. So we're given that we have 0.357 moles of N2. We want to figure out how many grams there are. Yeah, I would say that these inverse problems are probably easier since you only multiply. I'll give 45 more seconds for people who are still trying to figure it out. It's solved the same way. You start off with moles and then you do dimensional analysis just like I just did in the previous problem. But this time the moles are on the bottom and the grams are on the top. So you're basically multiplying them. Ten seconds. Okay, I'll share the results. So 
we're, we were a little over the place, but the most of us said C, and that is the correct answer. So I'll share, I'll go over how to do it. So we start off with what we have, which is 0 0.357 moles of N2. We use the molar mass, but this time the moles are on the bottom, so we could cancel them out. So 28 grams of N2 per one mole of N2. The moles of N2 cancel out. We multiply these two numbers, so it's 0 0.357 times 28. This is a time symbol. And we get around 10 grams of N2. So that's C. So these ones are kind of easier since you just multiply it instead of dividing the numbers. But you have to know which, uh, for these problems, make sure you actually cancel out the unit. So you know if the molar mass is divided or multiplied. And I believe this is our last example problem for today. It's basically a reverse of the previous one, but. So how many grams are in 2.74 moles of HCl? Like the, we had to first calculate the molar mass and then we could get the grams from it. Because molar mass is how we how we convert grams to moles. For these problems, you'll probably need a calculator. So I'll give around a minute left, a minute, one more minute to try to figure out this one since it's a little longer. Uh, 15 more seconds. Okay. So this one, we were kind of all over the place. Uh, two of you said A, one of you said B, two of you said C. The correct answer is actually A. So we got 40% correct. So the first thing to do is uh, calculate the molar mass. We've already done it. There's one hydrochloric, one HCl, and one, one hydrogen atom, and one H chlorine atom. So you just add up these masses together, and you get 36.45 grams per mole. So you start off with the, what we have, which is 2.74 moles. So we start off with 2.74 moles of HCl. And we use the molar mass. Since uh, the moles are on the top here, we want the moles on the top here. So we're multiplying by 36.45. So we have that one mole of HCl on the bottom. So we could cancel out these units. So we multiply these two numbers and we get around 100 grams of HCl. So that's A. And the answer key did say A. So, oh wait, there's a few more I forgot. And the last thing I want to review is actually pretty easy. It's percent yield. So, just remember, just because we calculated something theoretically, that doesn't actually mean we're actually going to get it in the lab. So percent yield is the actual yield over theoretical yield times 
and that tells us the percent yield. So how much did we actually get compared to what we expected? So for this reaction, the theoretical yield is 44 grams. And if only 33 grams is formed, what is the percent yield? So these calculations are very simple. It's use the formula actual over theoretical times 100. The actual is 33 grams. The theoretical is 44 grams and we multiply by 100. So we can put this in a calculator or do it in your math head and you'll get 75%. So let's do this one. Let's launch the poll. So the theoretical yield of water is 50 grams, but only 22 grams are formed. What is the percent yield for this reaction? So I'll give you a formula on the top, percent yield equals actual over theoretical times 100. We multiply it by 100 because we're making it a percent. If we only did actual over theoretical, that would give us a decimal. And then we multiply 100 to get into the percent part of it. I'll give around 45 more seconds. And the reaction on the top has nothing to do. It's with the problem. You don't need this reaction at all to do these percent calculation problems. These should be pretty easy. So let's end the polling. So a majority of you guys said B, that's correct. So let's put in the numbers. The actual is right here, only 22 formed. And the theoretical is 50. So you just put in those numbers. It's that simple. So 22 over 50 times 100. That's 44%, which is B. Okay, so that was our last problem. So I'd like to give some closing remarks before I end class today. So I would like to thank all of you for attending this course. It has been a pleasure to teach you guys chemistry. I hope you learned something new. So I would like to mention in high school chemistry course, there will be more concepts I didn't cover here because we only had 15 weeks and there's no way you can cover up all of the fresh uh, high school chemistry since it's usually nine months of content. And I hope you enjoyed this course. And I would like to point out there's many more courses that Alphademic Learning offers and I hope you would find some other course to pick up and learn some new things. And I hope you stay healthy and safe during these challenging times of COVID. And if you enjoy chemistry, I would recommend participating in the chemistry Olympiad competition. If you've done like math competitions like Math Counts or AMC, the chemistry Olympiad USNCO is similar to those. Uh, there's a local exam which everyone can join. And uh, they pick the top 10 or so from each local to go to nationals. As of right now, I am not, uh, I'm not considering a part three, although I may teach a course in the future as well. And I would like to share with you uh, this funny little picture. It's from the United States National Chemistry Olympiad. It's a mole because uh, we covered Avogadro's mole, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. 
So they had this little cute picture of a mole for the chemistry pun. And if you guys are going to participate in USNCO, this is the number one book. The first thing uh, before participating is I would recommend you going through an honors chemistry course and learning most of the concepts and then AP chemistry on top of that, that would give you most of the knowledge. And then beyond that, there's a few books. The first one right here is Atkins Chemical Principle. It's this one right here. I'll post the slides on Google Classroom so you can have the book just in case you want to participate. This is known to be like the top book for the competition. And another book I really like is Zumdahl Chemical Principles. I myself like Zumdahl over Atkins, but that's just a personal preference. So if you can do these two books or just one of them, you'll do fine. Just remember chemistry is problem solving and don't expect to memorize everything and expect to do well that way. You should like understand the concepts. And that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed the class. It was a pleasure teaching you. Bye everyone.